Hello. Uh, my name is Kevin Lynch, and I'm going to be telling you about Kubernetes in the data center. I'm going to be telling you about uh, Squarespace's journey towards self-service infrastructure. I've been working at uh, Squarespace for about three years, uh, so I've, I've seen our entire transition from a monolith application to microservices and onto Kubernetes. Um, just uh, some background for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, Squarespace was founded in 2003, and we provide a platform for people to host their websites, their commerce platform, and we host domains for them as well. And we have over a million customers. And going back to that founded in 2003 means that we uh, run out of uh, data centers. We predate AWS publicly. So we have three data centers, over 5,000 hosts in these data centers. And uh, for scale uh, comparisons, we have about 40 million metrics that we generate every minute. So there's a lot that's going on in these data centers all the time. Back in 2013, uh, we were less than 50 engineers. And we had a traditional uh, stack where we had a monolithic application uh, and you know, there were some background jobs and they communicated to a database. A lot of the world looked like this back then. And these, these engineers, you know, they, they needed, their goal was to introduce new features to, to build the product and to grow fast. And really what ended up happening was you know, whatever works was, was what we went with. Um, you know, we grew a little bit. Then, uh, in 2014, you know, we had about 75 engineers, and we realized that whatever works wasn't really working for us anymore. Uh, you know, engineers wanted to introduce new features, um, but there ended up being too much firefighting. Uh, you know, people were unsure of, of uh, the reliability and stability of the code they were introducing because there was so much going on in these monolithic applications. So like a lot of companies at that time, you know, we started down that microservices route, and it was great. We introduced a few services, and, and we, we formed uh, a, a very uh, stable uh, uh, definition of service at Squarespace. However, uh, you know, 2016, we have 100 plus engineers. You know, the platform was scalable and reliable, and developers could move faster, and Squarespace could move faster because of that. You know, we had all these services that were communicating with each other and, and, and taking traffic from, from the internet. Um, and all of these services uh, wasn't really uh, working for operations. So this is our, our typical workflow for provisioning new machines in, in our data centers, and whether it's iron or, or virtualized. Uh, it, it started with a very manual process of, of finding resources. You know, CPU, RAM, disk, wherever we could create this virtual machine. We'd have to assign, make sure we could assign networking. We'd have to make sure the networking worked. We had to add all of these hosts to our uh, in Ansible inventory. Um, and then we could kick off a, an automated process where you know, we would update DNS and, and pixie boot the, the VM and install the OS and configure the OS with all of these uh, dependencies that we've built up. We'd have to configure monitoring for them and, and install all the application de uh, dependencies as well. And finally, we could install the application. This, took, this process, at best, took about 30 minutes because of all of the manual operations and, and the pixie booting. Um, Oftentimes, it would take a lot more because you know, sometimes it, it would be painful to find these resources or, or painful to uh, you know, run into firewall issues and whatnot. So there had to be a better way. The big takeaway from this was static infrastructure and microservices do not mix. It was always difficult to find all these resources. It was very slow to provision and scale. And because we're running our data centers, we do have uh, you know, pets in this, in this environment. Every machine has, is uh, a special uh, case, right? And we were trying to shoehorn the, this microservice cattle mentality into uh, all of these, these pets, these physical pets that we, we love. Um, and also, this system was way too complex for any new engineers that came on board, whether they were developer, dev, development focused or operations focused. So we had to come up with a better solution. In 2017, we have about 200 engineers, a little over that, and uh, we started down this, this path of self-service infrastructure. 
finally, with the, with the help of self-service com compute networking metrics and storage, we're able, operations is finally able to move as fast as our developers and, and Squarespace can actually move as fast as we want it to. So for self-service compute, we use Kubernetes. You know, we all love containers, that's why we're here, and it's very simple. You know, you just say kube control apply and, and some uh, description of, of what service you want applied, and it just works. However, there's, there's a lot of pain points that we ran into that we weren't uh, aware of at the time. To take a step back, our, our service definitions that we deploy into Kubernetes closely match what we uh, deploy as, as a service on a VM. Uh, we have a, a Java a Spring Boot based service model, uh, which um, relies on a lot of the uh, Netflix utilities for uh, service discovery and, uh, and routing of, of requests. We use console for service discovery and key values. We use FluentD for logging to ship all of these service, uh, to ship all of the, our logs to a centralized Elk stack. And um, uh, we also uh, assign resources to these Java services uh, very similarly to how we uh, assign them to our VMs. So each Java service is, uh, on, is typically given two cores or four gigs of, and four gigs of RAM. Um, we, do, we do adjust this for, for certain services as well, but this is the default that we provision for all of them. However, we were running into problems with the Java microservice, and to really understand what was going on, um, we needed to understand how all of these pods are deployed to Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, each, each container maps to a, a C group, and these C groups are uh, assigned to, to each of these containers, and they're, they're given the, the resources based off of uh, the Kubernetes uh, requests and uh, limits. And uh, we, we assign requests equals to limits uh, for all of our services just to make things easier for us. Um, and once, once this is done, um, we were running into issues where we weren't seeing the, the performance that we saw in the pods as the VMs. And to really understand how this works, we needed to understand how the, the scheduler schedules these. So uh, we uh, map, so Kubernetes in, in Linux maps the CPU uh, requests to CPU shares, and it's able to throttle the, uh, the resources of, uh, base, of, of the service based off of the CPU quota limits. This is uh, implemented in Kubernetes, uh, in, in Linux, by um, uh, calculating the number of shares that are assigned to this uh, based off of the CPU request times 1024. And Kubernetes is aware of all of the uh, available shares based off of the uh, total number of cores on a system. On all of our Kubernetes nodes, we run 64-core uh, uh, boxes. Uh, so this would be assigned a, a about 65,000 shares for the entire box. Now, each service would then be throttled based off of the limit. So it's given an allotment of the CPU limit times 100 milliseconds, and that's calculated over 100 milliseconds. So if you wanted to, as to assign a, a container roughly two cores, it would uh, turn into uh, a CPU limit of two of 200 milliseconds over 100 milliseconds. So you could have two concurrent threads operating at the same time. So as an example, on our 64 core machine boxes, uh, our Java process would be given 2048 shares over uh, 65,000. So it's guaranteed at least that um, amount of resources to operate. And it, it's able to run for up to two threads during that uh, period. However, we were running into uh, painful scenarios where uh, the world would just stop when we were doing our stress testing. And the reason for this was because the, the JVM uh, uh, garbage collector threads were using up all of the CPU quota. So we had to figure out why this was happening. Um, so the, the JVM, we, when we uh, analyzed this, we saw that there were 64 garbage collector threads, 128 Jetty threads for uh, doing HTTP uh, traffic, and then there were 64 uh, JVM fork join threads for uh, parallel operations. These numbers uh, seem strange. They seem to match the number of cores. 
So we had to figure out what was going on. So all of the libraries in, in Java, uh, are, a lot of them are, are configured by, based on the number of available processors. Jetty does this, the JVM does this, and, and configures the four joining pools and the GC thread pools. And then there are, uh, could be various other libraries that would uh, access this to uh, automatically tune and scale the number of, of threads for a given uh, operation. And the JVM is able to detect this by uh, running a, a, a syscontrol call to get the number of online processors. We found that this wasn't being restricted by C groups. So we had to figure out what to do there. So we came up with a solution of providing a, a base Java container that would, was able to calculate all of these resources. And thankfully, uh, because the C groups is mounted inside of every container, uh, and provides uh, the values of all of these, we're able to uh, pretty much reverse engineer the number of uh, cores that are assigned to this by just looking at the, the number of quota uh, microseconds available and dividing that by the, by the period. And then we're able to automatically tune the JVM by passing in JVM flags where we're explicitly setting this. However, this doesn't solve all of the problems. Uh, we, were, uh, we still needed a way to uh, override the available processors call. And we did this by basically uh, relying on a, a C shared library where we pretty much override the JVM active processor count, which uh, is ultimately what the um, JVM calls. And, and we shim this in with a, a Linux preload hook uh, inside of the container. So then when the JVM calls available processors, we would return the number of cores uh, that we've assigned to this uh, via, via an environment variable that the base container calculated. So now we're able to actually have self-service compute where the developer doesn't really need to know what the, uh, what the underlying mechanism is. All they need to say is, I want a Java service with two cores and they're able to get this now. Going back to um, how we configure our, uh, uh, how our uh, Java services look, uh, like I said, we use Spring Boot for the core container and we use all of the Netflix utilities uh, for doing, uh, you know, we use Net, uh, Netflix ribbon for doing automatic retries or we could do client side load balancing uh, directly in the application. So every uh, Java service is, is shipped with all of this logic. And then we can do circuit breaking with Hystrix and service discovery with console. However, we were in a world where we wanted uh, to, to have our uh, VM uh, infrastructure still communicate with our, uh, with our pods that we're deploying into Kubernetes. And you know, each of the, the console agents need to communicate with each other for discovery. The Java services will ultimately need to communicate with each other directly. So we leveraged Calico for this. Um, Kubernetes uh, provides a pluggable uh, container network interface. Um, and there are many options. There's Flannel, Calico, Weave, KubeNet, VXLAN, probably a lot more than I'm aware of on this list. Uh, we ended up going with Calico because it gave us a few uh, benefits uh, for running in our data center. Uh, Calico provides uh, software-defined networking. Uh, we can use that to configure net network policy, IP tables, access rules, and it gives us the, the benefit of not needing network overlays uh, in our data centers. Uh, so that means we don't have any um, performance impact from doing encapsulation. Uh, it eliminates any MTU overhead that we may have, uh, and it also uh, gives us the ability to have seamless ingress and egress uh, be because of our network setup. So in our data center, uh, we've deployed what we, uh, what's referred to as uh, a layer three uh, claw topology. So this is a spine and leaf uh, architecture. Uh, and all of these uh, leafs are, are, are layer three uh, networking. So each, each of those, uh, uh, each rack um, uh, only communicates with each other rack over layer three. And this makes it very simple to, to understand because uh, the spines aren't doing any, any processing, and all of the leafs are, are their own uh, layer two domain. So any, any MAC addresses don't really, aren't seen by any other racks. And this makes it really easy to scale out and predictable and con consistent for any network communication, because anything communicating in one rack is going to have at most two hops to get to another rack. And it, this also gives us the ability of having anycast support as well. 
So all the, all the work is performed at, at the leaf switches, and, um, and each of these, these uh, racks are assigned their own BGP domain, which Calico relies upon. And this also gives us the added benefit of not having to worry about any, any issues like spanning tree protocol issues. There's no convergence time or, or, or loops that could be accidentally caused by this. So, uh, like I said, each of these uh, has their own BGP domain, which uh, means they have their own uh, layer three uh, network um, slice. So we can assign uh, a networking uh, a slash 24 net subnet to each of these. And we can also any cast the same IP across all of these. So this makes it a lot easier to, uh, to, um, cr uh, to have services uh, communicate with just any, any service IP and, and it will be routed to any healthy instance that can respond to that. So we use Calico to uh, do BGP peering directly with these leaf switches and uh, we, we pair that with all of our uh, Kubernetes nodes as well. And this allows us to seamlessly communicate whether it's a VM running on, on a rack in a different leaf switch, it can communicate with any uh, pod uh, that's running in Kubernetes. So this is a, a, the typical uh, Kubernetes architecture where we have some masters and, and some nodes running some pod workers. Uh, using Calico, we're able to announce directly the pod IPs, and these are represented as uh, slash 26 subnets uh, that Calico assigns directly to these. And uh, the Calico agent would then pick these up and announce them to the, to the top of rack switch. Likewise, we're able to announce directly the service IP range. So, all we have to do is add these to the loopback interface and tell Calico to announce these. And all of a sudden we have uh, the ability to, uh, for anything, uh, whether it's inside of Kubernetes or outside of Kubernetes, to communicate directly with this service IP range, which makes it a lot easier to, uh, for outside services or developers to access. And likewise, we can announce the, uh, we, can, we can assign uh, an Anycast address for the API server that we then bind the API server to. So we don't need any, any middleman uh, for communicating with the API server. We just uh, bind each API server that we want to this IP address and we can communicate with that IP, uh, which makes it a lot easier uh, in case uh, one of the master nodes goes down. We don't lose any uh, traffic to uh, the API servers. So this allows a developer from their laptop to communicate directly with a, a pod IP uh, to any, any of these uh, pods that are running in Kubernetes. Uh, they can communicate with the master IP, which is then any cast. And likewise, uh, they can uh, talk to a service IP as well. So this gives us uh, a, a really uh, powerful way for uh, our developers to, to have self-service networking without any uh, interaction with us. And then we can leverage the network policies as well to automatically assign um, firewall rules, for instance, uh, if we want for, for these services as well. Uh, we, the other benefit of this is that we can also uh, rely on this for federating as well, uh, because we have two data, uh, you know, multiple data centers. We can um, uh, seamlessly communicate from the, the pod network from one data center to another data center. And using the Federation API, we can then uh, control both of them at the same time. So the other, uh, the other uh, self-service uh, tool that we decided to, to use was uh, Prometheus. Um, historically, we use uh, Graphite for all of our VM-based uh, metrics. Uh, this had some uh, problems, un unfortunately. Uh, the application and uh, CollectD is, are sending metrics uh, either from the application or from the, from the system, and they're forwarding this to, to Graphite. Um, unfortunately, uh, we can easily run into scenarios where uh, the application developer just uh, added a, a, a new endpoint to generate metrics, and, and we have this uh, exponential uh, explosion of metrics as we deploy them to all of our services. And all of these are aggregated, all of these metrics are aggregated in Graphite, where each metric ends up becoming uh, its own file, uh, so, which is slow to create on, all, on in, the, in this cluster, 
and also really slow, expensive to, um, uh, to clean up. So when we have all of these ephemeral pods, we can't really uh, rely on this because we end up uh, overloading the graphite cluster and bringing it, it down. Uh, graphite also has some other problems as well, like there's loss of precision when it does uh, aggregate, aggregated roll-ups of all of these metrics as well. And it's, it's kind of inefficient to do aggregated calculations across all of these. We then use Sensu uh, to, to actually do alerting based off of, uh, uh, off of uh, the Sensu client that runs on the host. And uh, we can also trigger, we can also have that query graphite as well. Um, however, we were running into some problems with this. The, the application and, and the system are, are very tightly coupled. It then becomes really difficult for us to route alerts to it. What happens when the application goes down? Who do we route the alert to? The application dev? What happens when the system goes, when, when the whole uh, host goes down? Do we route that to the application developer? Do we route that to uh, the team that's in charge of, of running that host? And what happens if the whole hypervisor goes down? Who do, who do we alert? So we really want these, uh, our, our application level alerts to be uh, service level based. Um, However, when we pair Sensu with Graphite, it becomes really confusing to create because we had this centralized, this other uh, repository where devs would add to, have to go into and add all of these checks. And the checks were actually really expensive because doing all these aggregated checks on Graphite is painful. So in comes Prometheus. Prometheus uh, ties in really well with our Kubernetes infrastructure. It gives us the ability to do automatic discovery of all of our uh, containers, whether it's using the Kubernetes API to communicate with pods, or uh, it could communicate with console and discover any VM-based uh, application as well. Uh, there's no loss of precision because it just keeps appending metrics, and it's really great at, um, at storing tag data. So we can uh, store uh, metrics based with tags of whatever the service they're running, what pod they're running on, uh, which endpoint we're using to collect these metrics from, and, and so forth. And it's really, really great for these efficient, uh, for these ephemeral instances. So when a new pod comes up, all it is doing is, is modifying the tags that are, uh, for, that are being generated for that, uh, for that metric. Um, so all of those would be aggregated in, in ultimately the same Prometheus file. So we use the Prometheus operator for this. Uh, so we uh, assign each uh, team that wants to deploy services to Kubernetes their own uh, namespace. We also give them their own Prometheus instance as well. So this gives us a few benefits uh, because we are able to then um, uh, separate out uh, each, each, team's, uh, names, uh, each team's Prometheus metric collector. And that, that gives us the ability for you know, when uh, one of these Prometheus goes down, we don't lose metrics for everything. We just would lose that, uh, those metrics temporarily for that one team. So the Prometheus operator controls all of these Prometheus instances. And they'll look at, uh, they'll collect metrics from all of those team services. And we provide a centralized alert manager, which is also configured through the Prometheus operator that would then uh, route the alerts to pager duty. So at that point, all the service owners have to do is define their own alerts for all these services. And those alerts are the, the Prometheus Alert Manager specification that look like this. All, we have to do, all they have to do is provide a, a, a service level style uh, check where, uh, for instance, if we wanted to look at the error rates for a, a given service, all you have to do is, is look at the response, the uh, check for, um, response codes of 500. And if that is uh, you know, high for five minutes, um, then we would just send an alert to whatever team that is with uh, a page that says, this is critical, please look at this. So um, the, final, the final tool that we provide for our uh, developers is self-service storage. Um, historically, we have a centralized NFS cluster for all of our files, and we were running into a lot of problems where it was very difficult to uh, spin up a new uh, VM-based service that would have access to this. 
all of the uh, access controls were, were manual, manu manually configured in the NFS cluster, and we could also often run into issues uh, depending on the application with you know, things like file locking issues, uh, where you know, some service would be locking a file, it would die and wouldn't be able to uh, come up again because that, that file is locked on NFS. Um, we also uh, would leverage uh, ESX local storage as well. Um, However, this had some problems of you know, slow migrations. If we needed to spin up a, if we needed to move the VM elsewhere, uh, we would have to transfer all of the data from one host to another, and there was no replication. So in order to, to really provide self-service storage infrastructure, we needed something else. Uh, that's where Ceph comes in. Uh, Ceph gives us uh, the ability to um, deploy on commodity hardware, so all we have, uh, so we don't need these uh, expensive NFS uh, machines. And all we have to do is um, uh, uh, scale out the system whenever we need uh, more storage. Uh, Ceph provides automatic replication and it provides multiple access patterns as well. So we can access either block storage directly, uh, we can access uh, you know, CephFS, which is very similar to NFS, and we can also access uh, an object store. It provides a, a, an S3 compatible API. So again, we, to, to rely on this, we, uh, pr we, in Kubernetes, we uh, have uh, automatic provisioners that are uh, based off of the storage class concept. Um, all we have to do is define a default storage class for the block device and provide a provisioner that has the ability to access Ceph and create all of these, uh, all of these uh, blocks storage devices as they're requested. So all a developer would have to do is say, you know, I need a stateful set, and uh, here's the, the persistent volume claim that goes along with that. And then Kubernetes and, and the automatic provisioner take care of the rest. Uh, the RBD provisioner would then detect the creation of this, of this pod of this uh, persistent volume claim, and then create the block device, and then uh, allow the stateful set to then mount this, uh, this uh, persistent volume, which is then mapped directly to, the, to that block device. And it'll manage the, the life cycle of that as well. So when you get rid of the stateful set, the, uh, the block storage is cleaned up as well. So we rely on this uh, for some uh, tools. So we have uh, Prometheus, all of the Prometheus instances are uh, relying on these uh, persistent volume claims to, uh, to store all of their metric data uh, for some amount of time. Uh, we also have some deployments of MongoDB and Postgres uh, relying on this as well. And uh, they've, been, uh, running, um, uh, they've been running great for us so far. Likewise, we can uh, rely on the uh, CephFS uh, shared storage for this. This gives us the ability of having uh, multiple uh, services access the same NFS pool um, by uh, creating just a single PVC that any service instance is able to access. And then uh, the CephFS provisioner would create a shared mount uh, that all of these are able to access and share data across. The final way for accessing, uh, of course, would be for the service to directly communicate with the uh, S3-like uh, API. So all, all that has to do is uh, you know, create a bucket and then access anything in there. Um, and then this would be uh, completely uh, separate of any of the uh, Kubernetes um, automatic provisioners. So with the help of Kubernetes, Calico, Prometheus, and Ceph, uh, we're able to provide self-service infrastructure for all of our developers. And we've seen a lot of benefits from this. Uh, our existing services are migrated very quickly. All it takes is uh, a couple hours of, of work to, to migrate a service, verify that it's healthy, and create the appropriate Prometheus dashboards for it. Um, we're also seeing a lot more adoption from developers. We're seeing about 20 new services that I'm aware of that are uh, being planned for Q1. Uh, which is a lot larger than what we've seen before for one quarter. And we're really seeing true uh, microservice adoption. So we're seeing a lot of developers who want to spin up you know, small experiments, 
uh, that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do in our infrastructure because of the long process for creating all of these VMs. So, uh, so finally, Squarespace is able to move as, as quickly as we want it to. Well, thank you for listening to me. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, so we, we run the databases in Kubernetes. Uh, uh, so uh, we have some st uh, stateful sets for Mongo, and uh, we've got some stateful sets for Postgres. And like I, uh, like I said earlier, all they have to do is define that PVC, and then uh, they have shared storage. That, uh, so then when the pod goes down, it's just migrated to another host and, and comes back online with the same data. So we run all of the Prometheus instances in the same cluster. Uh, we then federate up all of the metric data to an external system as well uh, that has a lot more uh, capacity for storage. So uh, we don't abstract that. Um, we are, uh, right now, the service developers are uh, writing the, the YAML, the Kubernetes YAML descriptions, but we do have a generator tool for the new services that'll generate an entire uh, 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 Spring Boot application, and along with that, we generate all of the, um, the prescribed uh, deployment and, and alerts for all of those services. I'm sorry, I didn't. In a browser, if you take time, you don't have a big challenge with data spaces. But here, if you uh, take time, you can use one of the data and then begin as a data frame with the pod. Yeah. So, how are you going to do the big challenge with the normal demand and then use the pod? With the network policies, you mean? No, no, no. So, for the network policies, the data for a defined client. Yeah. And then, uh, once it's there, it's up to the yeah. pod. Yeah, so, so it's, con it's connected to two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so we use, um, so there's redundancy at, at, the, at the network connection layer, and then there's uh, redundancy with, uh, with um, each, of the, each of the leafs communicating with, with two spines. Is it, yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, so, so, so Spring Boot, we're not relying on console for the configuration itself. Uh, so we're using, uh, so, so when they're deployed as VMs, we just use a, 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 just a regular config YAML file that we've deployed to, to each of those hosts along with that code. Um, we can also use uh, environment variables as well, which is what we use in the Kubernetes environment. Um, if, if there's any, any uh, information that the service wants itself, uh, it would communicate with the key value store directly with console, yeah. Um, so we haven't uh, we haven't had the need yet to really like squeeze performance out of it. So we haven't gone down that path yet. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that there was no performance loss moving to uh, Kubernetes. Um, so I think that's something we're going to be exploring later on, like really how small can we, can we get all of these services and, and, and what's the trade-off between uh, instance size and uh, number of instances? Because um, you know, we're dealing with the JVM, which isn't the friendliest of beasts. <laughs> No, 
No, the, the memory side seemed fine. Because uh, we were, uh, well, I mean, we, we, uh, pass, we pass in very similarly in that base container. We uh, calculate the, the number of, um, the, the amount of uh, uh, RAM that's assigned to that, and then we scale the heap appropriately. So I think um, uh, it's, it's tunable, but I think by default we give the heap 50% and allow 50% of uh, non-heap. But that's tunable per service as well. Uh, uh, no, we didn't uh, go down that path. Uh, we did uh, use Mesos for a little bit. Uh, our data team was using that uh, as kind of a, a, an internal uh, test. And uh, that was right around the same time that Kubernetes really, really was becoming popular. So uh, we saw a lot of benefit in switching to that early on. No, we didn't. What's that? No. All right, thank you.